Lord, your word says that all men are like grass and their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be our teacher today. Make your word plain to our understanding and challenge us afresh, we pray, for Christ our Saviour's sake. Amen. We come then this morning to start the short series on the life of Elijah. There's some people in the journey of life who really stand out and make an impression on our lives. Sometimes we meet lots and lots of different people, but as our life goes on, there's one or two people who really make an impact and are outstanding uh, in, uh, in our lives. And I believe that when we get to know Elijah from Tishbe and uh, the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead, he, he will be remembered. We, we will stay with him in our minds and uh, he, he will be a treasured hero from the Old Testament. He's a most remarkable man that we're going to be looking at uh, over these next couple of days. We're going to see that he's a person of courage. We're going to see that he's tremendously outspoken, that he's brave, fearless, adventurous, and incredibly bold. He's one of those men who stand head and shoulders above others as one of the great heroes of the Old Testament. But one of the lovely aspects about Elijah is this, is that he's an ordinary man. In fact, the Bible in the book of James says he's a man just like us. And what the Bible is doing there is showing us that he had failures, that he had fears, that he made mistakes, he had his doubts, he got angry and he got depressed. So it's interesting that although he's a hero right up there, he's also got clay feet like you and I who make, often made mistakes. So James, the half-brother of our Lord, says uh, Elijah was a human just like us. And over the next weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to be looking at this man and his exploits and his incredible courage. Elijah was honored by the Lord in, in a most remarkable way. We know that in the New Testament, when Jesus was wonderfully changed on the mountain, remember he took that inner group of disciples up to the mountain, and the glory of God not so much shone on him, but the glory of God that was within him shone out. As it were, the curtains were torn back, and those disciples saw the immense glory of Christ on the mountain of the transfiguration. And two giants from the Old Testament uh, showed up. One of them was Moses, and that's right. The other one was Elijah. And it just shows you the high regard that the Bible gives this man, Elijah, and the powerful lessons that come to us uh, from his life as one of the heroes. He starts his, his story starts there in 1 Kings 17 and just creeps into 2 Kings chapter 2. And we're going to just do highlights from uh, his life. In fact, in many ways, he's like Christ in that he comes as a great hero in a very dark time in Israel's history. And in many ways as well, we know there's a parallel between his life and the life of John the Baptist. That's right. Remember, he dressed like John the Baptist, or John the Baptist dressed like him. John the Baptist was a fiery prophet out of the desert, and Elijah was a fiery prophet out of the desert. Elijah wore a rough camel's hair clothing with a great leather belt around his waist, very rough clothes, and that's exactly how John the Baptist came. And so there, there's parallels between Jesus and Elijah and John the Baptist uh, and Elijah. Elijah. Let's come then to, to look at this man, Elijah, and for us to um, really appreciate him, we've got to see him in his time. We've got to see him in the backdrop of what was happening in that particular day, for us to appreciate how brave and courageous he was. Now, I'm sure you uh, know something of the journey of uh, the, the Lord's people, Israel, how they asked for a king when they should never have asked for a king. 
God should have always been their king, but they want to be like the nations around them. That's their big problem, you see. So they get a king, and their king doesn't live up to expectation. He taxes them to death. And you say to me, well, what changes? He taxes them to death. He takes their young men into war and so on. He's a bit of a failure as a king is uh, Saul. And uh, Saul eventually gives over to David, who's God's choice. David is a great king, but he's also got his failures. David passes on to his, his son Solomon. The wisest man in the world makes the biggest mistake that any man's ever made. He takes on a thousand wives. Imagine a thousand mother-in-laws. You say, why did he do this? Was he a pervert? No, he wasn't. He's very clever. He realized that if he made alliances with all the kings around him and married their daughters and bore their grandkids, none of those kings, kings are going to go to war with him. So it was a way of making peace with all the people by marrying the daughters, having their grandkids, and no one would go to war against him. Solomon gives over to his sons, um, who are just rat bags. They're really they're failures. And eventually the whole uh, nation of Israel splits into a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom. In the north there's ten tribes, in the south there's um, two tribes. And they all have kings to rule them, but they're all dismal. They, they're all failures. They, they, they get it wrong. There's a few bright lights that pop up now and then, but generally they're a bunch of rat bags who fail God dismally. And, and it's so sad, because they, they had such potential. They started so well. You think under David how they were the people of God eating out of the hand of God. And just 50 years later, we come to the, the state of Israel in the, in the north where um, Ahab is king. Ahab was the wretched man, a weak, spineless leader. And he marries this woman, this witch, Jezebel. Just the saying of her name leaves a, a, a bitter taste in your mouth. He marries this woman, Jezebel, who is the daughter of Ethbal. And Ethbal was the leader of Baal worship, a great challenge to God. And so this, this wretched woman brings into the people of God all the clutter of her dreadful idols and leads them all astray. Ahab is spineless to stop her action. In fact, the passage was read to us so clearly there by joy. Remember, we're in um, 1 Kings chapter uh, 16, and, and we've got those words, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than those who, who were before him. How terrible. Imagine having that as your epitaph. You did more evil than anybody before you. How terrible. He not only considered a trivial matter to commit the sins of Jeroboam, who was himself the father of wickedness, but he also married that woman Jezebel. And it goes on. He set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal that he built. He should have been building a place for the worship of God. The king of God's people builds a altar to a foreign god on God's property. What a, what a scoundrel this man is. He brings down the, into shame the glory of God. And it says, the God of Israel. Um, Ahab also made an Ashtaroth pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, um, to anger then all the kings of Israel. So he built the, these, these worship to Baal and Ashtaroth. They, they were two sort of twin gods that went together. With their worship was the most indescribable, essential sexual worship. Because you see, Baal was supposed to be the god of fertility. So worshipping Baal and Ashtaroth led to all kinds of sexual promiscuity. There were thousands of male and female prostitutes, and you did your worship of God, their Baal, in that way. Furthermore, he was the one who was supposed to provide the nourishment for the land. So they all looked to Baal. What a, what a blight that God's people should carry on in this way. After God had said quite clearly in Exodus, you shall have... No other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an image of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, your your God, am a jealous God. And they provoked the jealousy of God with their Baals and their Ashtaroths and their worship. Some of them, horror of horrors, even worship Moloch. Moloch was a dreadful god with an with a empty pit of a stomach where they built a huge fire around him and then rested their infants in his stomach. How they had slumped. Do not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything, any sacred stone for yourself, and do not place carved stones in the land. They did exactly what God said they must not do. And then there's Jezebel, this witch of a woman, corrupting, cursing, um, debauching the people of God. And what's more, she had a vendetta. Her vendetta was to spill the blood of God's prophets. She, she, she went on a murderous rampage to destroy anybody in Israel who, who followed God. And we're going to see that she bathed for the blood of Elijah in a later uh, sermon, which we'll come to look at. All, all she wanted was to destroy God's name from the land. Even in the New Testament... When we have the letter to the seven churches, one of the evils of the church was this. It says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Not to suggest that Jezebel had a reincarnation, but the people were being sexually immoral in the church. And so the Lord writes to the church and says, You're tolerating Jezebel. You're tolerating the the very epitome of wickedness. It was to this cauldron, to this hodgepodge, this this, this pot of, of corruption and evil that God sends his man. It's important that I painted that picture because it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to step up and step out. But I want to suggest... I want to suggest that it's not easy to step up today. It's not easy to make a stand for God today. It was jolly hard for Elijah to barge in to the very presence of the king and confront him, pointing his finger in Ahab's face with that woman Jezebel. It must have cost him everything. And my dear friends, it it will cost us to be a Christian. We get this idea that Christianity is so comfortable. On the contrary, the Bible calls us to be the salt and the light of the world. That is confrontational. Now, I'm not saying go out and look for warfare with others. It will find you if you're a Christian. But I'm saying we can't hide under a bush. Elijah couldn't hide back in Tishbe Tishbe, and hide on the farm because that's where he came from. He had to stand up. And my dear friends, God calls us to stand up. God calls us to make a stand for him in the world in which we live. Okay, they don't bow down to idols, but we've got our idols in these days. Our idols of our houses and our sport and our entertainment and democracy. Have you seen today how democracy has become the idol of the day? You dare say anything or do anything against democracy. Democracy has become the holy cow of our day. As though democracy was the gift of God. It's not. Very often the majority are wrong. God's word is right. We live under a theocracy. We live under God's word and God's rule. Let's mind the idols that we've set up for our day. How many people will not be in the house of God? How many people will not name God? How many people will spend a fortune on other things and not give one cent to the mission of God? There are many idols around today. They just call them by different names, but they're still idols. You see, anything that takes us away from God and the worship of God has become an idol. You see, we need to stand up to. Um, We need to, the Bible says this, do everything without grumbling or complaining so that you might become blameless and pure. Note this, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Crooked and depraved. Would you describe our generation as crooked and depraved? A generation which says white is black, which says wrong is right, which says moral is immoral and immoral is moral. We live in an upside down world. 
But someone has changed the price tags and changed the values. Yet we live in this hodgepodge. And in this place, we need to be like Elijah, standing up, challenging the standards of our day and living for God. And you say that will be hard. Of course it will be hard. We're called to be cross bearers and not couch sitters. Let's come then to look at some aspects of Elijah's life. I want to suggest three of them to you. The first thing I want to point out about Elijah, he was a man of incredible character because he was a man fully given to God. There's one thing you've got to say about this man we're being introduced to. He was fully given to God. For Elijah, note this, for Elijah there were no half measures. For Elijah, there was no part-time devotion to God. There was no part-time loyalty. There was no half-hearted commitment. He was flat out for God. Elijah was called from the back end of nowhere. He, the Bible tells us that every word of Scripture is for our learning, and we're not going beyond verse 1 of chapter 7, which says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead. In other words, the Bible wants us to know his name. His name is Elijah. Elijah means Jehovah is my God. Quite a name, isn't it? We know nothing about his family. We, we know nothing about his parents. But I want to suggest he must have come from a godly home. For them to call his name, Jehovah is my God, was, was quite a name to bear. And, and he comes, this man Elijah, he comes from Tishbe. In, he, he comes for, he's a Tishbat from Tishbe in Gilead. In other words, from the back end of nowhere. He comes from the back country. This is a farm boy. This is a guy straight off the farm. No great education, no great learning, no great culture. Look at his clothes. The clothes of a ruffian. It's camel's hair, rough clothes with a rough belt around his, his, his waist and sandals. That's all he's got. He, he's a, from the back end of nowhere, a commoner. And God takes him because he's fully committed to God. And my I say, my dear friend, we, we don't have to have great breeding and great education and great ability. we just got to be available. Elijah was available to be God's person. Will you be available? And you say, well, I've got no breeding and background and culture. Nor did he. <laughs> he came from the back end of nowhere. Elijah, a Tishbat from Tishbe in Gilead, from the hill country from the back end. You see, God's wanting to use ordinary people. I've noticed that as I read scripture, it's the ordinary. Very often, the small and the weak. God knows that's why I stand before you today. Ordinary people, just, just an ordinary person, available to God. The Bible says this, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential or of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So in other words, God scrapes the barrel. When he wants men and women for himself, it's ordinary people. Put their hand up like these two young people did today. Put their hand up and say, here I am. Whatever you want, wherever you want to send me, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. So Elijah steps out. He steps into the palace of this treacherous king with a witch of a wife, and he points his finger in their face. And you know what he says? Note what he says there. As the Lord, the God of Israel, live, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. What was he saying? Why did he say neither dew nor rain? What was he up to? He was throwing down the gauntlet. He was throwing down a challenge. Remember I said Baal was the god, the god of fertility and prosperity. He was supposed to be the god that sent the rain. So God says, okay, I'll set a challenge for you. Will Baal give rain in the next three years or will God give rain? God says, I choose to withhold the rain and the dew. The dew was very heavy in Palestine and could help wet the soil very thoroughly. There'll be no dew, there'll be no rain. In other words, God is saying, let's see who the real provider is. He was throwing down the gauntlet. No dew, no rain. That was quite a message. He, I'm sure when he left the palace, he must have run from the palace because Ahab will want his neck in a noose. But you see, he was prepared 
to give a hard message because he is fully devoted to God. And I wonder if you are prepared to hide the fact that you're a Christian or you're prepared to stand up and speak up. So the first thing about Elijah, he was fully given to God. The second thing about him, he was a man who trusted in the living God. I want you to note that end bit, the living God. For it says there, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives. Ha ha, there it is. When Elijah comes and points his grubby finger in the face of Ahab, he says, I serve... The living God. See what he's doing. Ahab and Jezebel had set up stones and poles and shiny bits of metal calling them God. Ahab comes and says, um, um, Elijah comes and says, I serve the living God. The difference. You worship stones who cannot answer. I worship the living God. You worship idols and metal. I worship the living God. And you know, my dear friends, we as Christians worship a living God. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He has conquered the grave. We don't have some religious practices. We have a relationship. That's the difference, you see. We're not religious people. We don't do religion and walk away. We live with God. We, we have relationship with him. The Lord is mine and I am his. I call him Father. You see, that's the difference that between Elijah and Ahab. Ahab worshipped stones. Elijah says, I serve the living God. That's the message of the Bible. In Acts chapter 14, the early disciples said this, Friends, we are doing these things. We too are human beings. We bring you the good news to tell you um, to, tell you to turn from worthless things to the living God. The apostle said, turn from worthless things to the living God. I wonder if that's a word for you today. Turn from worthless things to the living God. And then again in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. If I am delayed in coming to you, you will know how people ought to live in God's way, which is the church of the living God. This is the church of the living God. No statue here. No idols in this place. But we based on faith in the true and living God. The Bible says this, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. See, that's the difference. We don't worship stones and buildings and cars and money and the stock market and all that money can buy. No, no, no. We worship the true and the living God. We have a relationship with him. We hear from him. We don't have a dead leader, a past saviour, a deceased God. No, no. That old song, um, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. That's, how, that's what Christianity is. A walk with a living saviour. That great uh, leader, Martin Luther, who headed up the Reformation, remember, he was the man brave enough to take the groundswell of teaching, it wasn't all his, it was the groundswell of teaching in that day, to stand against the Roman Catholic Church with its idols, with its popes, with its bishops, and all the rest of it. And he tucked a Bible under his hand and said, here I stand, I can do no other. And he took the whole known religious world on with a Bible under his arm, and he triumphed. That, that great man of God, he was once a monk and then he became wonderfully converted, came to faith and trust in Christ. As time went on, Martin Luther married a, a lovely, lovely lady and um, they had some children together. But as time went on with all the conflicts and uh, all, nearly all of Martin Luther's life was huge conflict uh, with the established church because uh, they didn't want people to have a Bible in their hand. They didn't want people to have the freedom of worshipping God. That was reserved for the religious elite. Uh, Luther was putting the Bible and Christianity in our hands and in our shoes. He was giving it to the common people, and the church opposed that. Well, one day Luther was quite depressed with uh, a big fight he was having uh, over making the Bible freely available. And uh, he was quite depressed, and it went on for some days. And you ladies know how miserable it is when your husband is miserable. So um, what she did, she dressed in black. 
And then she dressed the kids in black. And Martin Luther was beavering away in his study, and he looked up and he saw coming down the steps his wife in black and the children in black. And he said, well, where, where are you going, my dear? She said, oh, we're going to a funeral. He said, oh, well, how come I haven't been invited to a funeral? She said, no, you at the funeral. Well, then he said, well, who died? She said, well, God died. God died. The way you're carrying on, it's as though God were dead. And that shook Martin Luther, and he realized how silly he had been to allow other people to, to rob him of his joy, and it shook him out of his depression, and he never slumped back again to that extent. God has died, she said. What, what a good reminder that was to her, uh, to him that, that God hasn't died, God is alive. And you know, I think some of us live as though God were dead, or as though God were irrelevant. Elijah lived under the eye of the living God. And that's how we live. We live with a living God, and we're in relationship with him through Christ. So the third thing I want to say about Elijah to you today is that Elijah was conscious of God's now presence. Can I, can I use bad grammar there? He was uh, conscious of God's uh, imminent presence. He knew God was with him. Notice in that verse, it says this, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Galead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve. You see those words, whom I serve? They can also be translated, in whose presence I serve, or in whose presence I stand. In fact, some translations translate it in that way. In whose presence I stand. So you see, Elijah realized he lived in the presence of God. That will change your life. That will change your behavior. That will change your conduct. That will change your relationships. That will change everything in your life. If you learn to understand, we live under the all-seeing eye of a sovereign God. You've often heard that passage quoted where two or three are gathered together in your midst there, I, I am. That's nonsense. That's not related to God's presence at all. That passage is related to church discipline. You see, God is present when you are present. God is present when you are not there. God doesn't need two or three gathered together to be present. Contrary, God is all present. God is always present. And my dear friends, as Elijah realized he lived under the all-seeing eye of a sovereign God, and he, when he walked into uh, Ahab's presence and Jezebel's presence, he says, I stand here, and I'm standing here in God's sight, and so are you, with your, with your worship, with, with your idols, with, with your flagrant aggression against God's people. You also live under the all-seeing eye of God. And my dear friends, so do we. Young people, don't compromise, for we all live under the all-seeing eye of a holy God. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, nothing in all creation is hid from his eye. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we need to give an account. That should frighten the life out of you. But we live... In the Bible, the, translating it, we live exposed, pulled back. That's what the Greek word is. We live, the covers are pulled back. The curtain is pulled back. We live exposed. You see, when you switch the lights off and draw the curtain, don't think God can't see. When you're alone with your television or your, 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 your device, don't think for a moment God can't see. Everything of life is laid bare before him. And so Elijah comes before the king and says, I not only live in his presence, but I stand in his presence. God sees me at this moment. The Lord is in his holy temple, says the psalmist. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on the earth. His eye examines them. <sighs> That's heavy. His eye examines them, scrutinizes them. As many of you know, for a number of years, I would go off to China and uh, go do Bible teaching there. And well, they were great years. A number of years I went uh, to teach the Bible in the underground church. And uh, we had great times, um, a little bit scary sometimes. Because when you land in China at the airport, there's cameras. 
watching you. And your passport has got your picture on it, and they scan it. And then when you leave the airport, they're watching you. And when you go along the road, there's cameras watching you. And when you walk into the hotel, there's cameras watching you. And when you go to the shopping center, there's cameras. In fact, you don't go anywhere in China without them watching you from the moment you come to the moment you leave. And they've got this incredible facial recognition. They know exactly where you're going and exactly what you're doing. They're watching all the time. What is that to God? The all-seeing God sees us all the time. We're never, we're never out of his presence. It says this, The eye of the Lord are on the righteous, and, their ear, and his ear is attentive to their prayer. The eye of the Lord, the all-seeing eye. Now, in one way, that gives me great comfort. Enormously comforting. I am under the all-seeing eye of a sovereign God. So, he knows me, he knows my difficulties, he knows my setbacks, he knows when I need help, he knows when I need provision. I'm never out of his care. His eye is on the sparrow and he watches over me. Incredibly comforting. My God shall supply all my needs because he watches me. So it's incredibly comforting, but it's also absolutely concerning. It's absolutely concerning. You see, nothing is done in the dark. Remember David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, no one saw it but God and called him to account. Remember in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, that young couple that sold a piece of real estate and brought the money to the apostles, and, and they said, this was all the money for the property. And they said, oh, is it all? Oh, yes, it was all. Both of them said it was all. And they came under the chastisement of God for lying because they withheld. How did the apostles know they withheld? They didn't see it. God saw it. You see, God sees us when it's inconvenient. God sees us when it's convenient. So what have we learned from Elijah's life? We've learned three things this morning. A great man, a memorable man. Number one, he was a man fully given to God. Oh, that we would be fully given to God. The Bible says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of all that God has done, give him your whole body. So, so say, Lord, in the light of what you have done, I don't want to hold anything back from you. Fully given to God. Number two, he was a man who trusted the living God. It wasn't some cold religion for him. It was a moment-by-moment -moment relationship walk with him. But the Lord is our God. He is the living God. We walk with the living God. And then lastly, he was conscious that he was under the all-seeing eye of a sovereign God. His life was conformed to God because God saw him when it was convenient and not convenient. You know, my dear friends, as we step into this week, God will see us when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. We'd be wise to live right. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, as we've just started the adventure in this incredible man, this memorable man, we thank you for these life lessons which come to us from his life. We pray that we too would be unashamed of you before anybody or anything in our world. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would maintain that, that sweet relationship with you as our Father, as our provider, that we would know you to be the living God and that we'd live circumspectly under the all-seeing, examining, scrutinizing eye of God. Thank you for the comfort, Lord, that that wells in our hearts, knowing that you know our inner anxieties. But Lord, help us to remember also it's not convenient sometimes to know that you know us. Help us to live with great regard for you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen.